Pues claro. In the trenches with Ryan Roxy. Hello, 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 hello. Ryan Roxy here, and welcome to a, another live stream episode of In the Trenches with Ryan Roxy. I am your host. If you are listening to us on Apple Podcasts or if you're listening to us on any of the other Spotify type platforms where you can't see our lovely mugs, get yourself on over to YouTube and a Facebook Live. And if you're on YouTube and you're in the chat room, hello as well. Um, you can be a part of the show today. Uh, this is a part two. And uh, we're always a little bit trepidatious about doing part twos because, you know, if you go to see the movies, do part twos ever really live up other than, and I know it's the old saying, everyone says, yeah, Godfather 2, that always does it. But, you know, even Rocky 2 for me, Jaws 2, any of these types of uh, part twos never seem to live up. But you know what? I have confidence in today because we both discussed it. Me and our guests discussed it before. And uh, we are going to sort of, well, already it's better because we have good internet today. And we're going to we'll say a little prayer that the uh, Los Angeles internet gods uh, cooperate with us because that's where our guest is coming from. And um, he's been on before, and that's the reason why you guys are all here checking it out. Again, um, if you're new to the In the Trenches podcast, uh, just hit that subscribe button right there on the uh, YouTube live or just subscribe to the channel because you don't want to miss any of these episodes, especially today. All right. So let me bring him on without any further hype, because I don't know where we're going to go with this because we've discussed it and we didn't really come up with a game plan. It's going to we're going to I have a, a, a bit of a a bit of an idea, but it's part two. So, you know, I, get, I know what my first question is. <laughs> it's going to go downhill from there or uphill. Let's see. Would you welcome to In the Trenches, Mr. Kane Roberts? Hello. Hi there, Ryan. How you doing? Already it sounds better. Dude, I mean, last time we had we had those internet hiccups, and I think you were doing it from an iPhone, and you well, know, I just I just woke up. I, I thought it was nine p.m., so I woke <laughs> up at like eight forty-five, and I just ran down in my bathrobe. It was just it was awful. Also, you know, they extracted a tooth right before the COVID hit, so while I'm talking, I had a piece of gum up there to sort of because it's right in front. You know what I mean? So I've been walking around without a tooth literally for five months, but I'm going to Friday, so it should be good. Well, those are the stories behind the stories that I think people really want to hear. And that's where we kick off part two. Kane is doing yep. it toothless. He's doing yes. he's doing part two. Now, has it been recrowned? Is it, is it no, fixed now? No, there was just nothing there. So, uh, you know, he gave me a temporary thing that I'm doing right now. So it's just one of those things, you know, I'll be at a restaurant and I'll take a bite out of something and my tooth comes out. So, but really, do, do you just shove it back in or what are you doing? Or are you, you going back to the gum? Right back in and smile at the waitress. It's, it's really an attractive moment. I like my kids it. have done that with braces. Now they like, apparently braces come off a lot easier than when I was a kid. When I was a kid, they probably used something that was toxic and yeah. you know, they just used cement, but they never came off. But my kids, uh, braces, they come off all the time and they have to yeah, go they, back. They in. used a rusted fence wire, I think back in those days. So. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of rusted fence wire, I mean, last time you you uh, interviewed from your couch, now you look like you've just been interrogated inside, inside uh, some sort I, of know, prison I cell. I, I can't, you know, I've got to put something, you know, behind if I do another interview, which I probably will. Maybe, uh, maybe a giant picture of me. No, no, I don't know. I got, I got to figure something else. Uh, I, by the way, I just wanted to, uh, you know, mention like. It, it's funny, like when you're in, when we do what we do, I think, you know, I mean, to a certain extent, I'm kind of a fanboy. I mean, even when I met Alice Cooper, I was like, whoa, you know, I'm going to meet Alice. And, you know, I, I, as I said before, I wasn't nervous, but, you know, you're excited. You don't, you don't know what these people are going to be like. Um, one guy that I just met is uh, this guy Doyle from uh, Misfits. You know, he's my bro now, a really amazing guy. Listen, I'll show you, I'll show you what he did. Doyle is, is definitely... He's on the same workout regimen as you are. And it, oh, was yeah, that? yeah. I mean, I, mean, I see, know that. Like, see, he, he sent me a keychain, which is good. <laughs> he sent me one of his records, which is awesome. And then he sent me another one. And then he... Uh, he didn't send you any hair product, because I know he uses that all by himself. <laughs> he sent me a, a shirt. 
which oh, was yeah. cool. You know, I say oh, that's awesome. I wear these all the time. These are my Doyle shorts, you know. And then, of course, he sent me another shirt, a black version of the shirt. So, so the you guys pretty much is, You know, you meet certain people and they're really nice. When I met Alice, we became great friends right away. So right. Uh, uh, I think I think what happens, and I'm sure it's happened to you, like you'll say, oh, geez, I wonder what this guy's going to be like. And then you find out that they're just really sweet people, even though their image, you know, is, is kind of hardcore, whatever it is. You yeah. find out that uh, there's a lot of great people in the music industry. And, and, you know, Doyle's definitely one of them. I thought that uh, about you for like about 20 years, Kane. I really did because I because I, you have to understand, I came into the band in 96. So yeah. it was always living up to this godlike and I and and honestly literally a godlike creature because that's what you uh, that that was your sort of image in the 80s of of like basically Hercules meets Zeus meets, you know, well, there you go, <laughs> enough said. And, yeah. and and of course you were not intimidating at all with a friggin' machine gun guitar. So so I had to live up to this, you know, this image, and I was always waiting to meet you. But we we never really crossed paths back then. But Alice would say, "Oh, dude, when you meet Kane, he's a funny guy. You're gonna you're, you're gonna you're gonna yeah. love Kane because you have the same sense of humor." Well, see, Alice always says that I'm the funny guy, and you know from knowing Alice, he's the funny guy oh, he's, because he can he can make you. I'm sure on some bus rides, you guys have been in tears. I mean, the oh, guy yeah. is so funny. And then the players in his story are like John Lennon and Jimi Hendrix. And, you know, and you're, you're just sitting there in awe at what, you know, and, and, and you know, with, with all the quote unquote, you know, evil, hellish, satanic stuff that people read into what he does. He's just like this brilliant, funny fucking guy. And, and it's yeah. just amazing, you know. Um, He's quick. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's got just, he's got he's got a quick wit, and I agree with you about those stories because when people ask me, oh, what's it like hanging out with with Alice? And I say, well, he makes you feel like you're the most important person in the room when he clearly is the most important person yeah. of rock and roll in, in in many people's eyes. So the thing was though, he would tell these stories and I would hear them first person. And that's actually a reason why we have a segment in the show that I'm going to get to a little bit later with you sure. is never let the truth get in the way of a good story. Alice taught right. me that, right? But yeah. so so he does like to exaggerate a good story. He exaggerates a little bit. A yeah. little bit. But then again, when he every once in a while, he'll just he'll, when he'll drop that name, he'll say, "Yeah, well, you know, Keith Moon came to my house is that he was the house guest that wouldn't leave." And it was right. like, "Really, really?" And then it's backed up by Cheryl, and then all of a sudden then I read it in an old, you know, in some sort of biography somewhere. So he does have a a lot of truth to every story. Well, yeah, I'll never, the, the, when I first was with him, I think I mentioned before, uh, Shep sent us on this kind of tour of the United States to write in different cities. I, they, they thought like I, we needed a change of environment. So, um, what year so was I that? Remember, I remember we were in Connecticut and we were supposed to meet with uh, Dennis Dunaway and Neil Smith. So I was watching Star Trek in my room. And uh, Alice um, came in and he was standing there. And I didn't know him that well, by the way. I mean, I knew him, you know, we'd hung out a lot. But at this point, you know, I didn't know him that well. Uh, and so he's standing there looking at the TV. And I said, what's going on? He goes, I'm just making sure you're watching the right things. And <laughs> he, was, he had a glass with ice with Diet Coke, right? So mm -hmm. while we're watching... He just dumps the coke out on the floor, and he went, "Oh shit!" And I said, "I said, what is that?" And he said, uh, "When you know, back in the day when he used to drink, he was telling me one time he was at the record company president's house for a party, and he's talking to him, and his whiskey went flat, so he just dumped it on the guy's floor <laughs> and just and poured another drink." And I was, he goes, "He goes, you know, I, I don't drink move. anymore." He said, "But I got to get out of that habit." And I said, "Yeah, maybe." You know, pretty funny. <laughs> You're going to ruin a lot of, you're going to get some cleaning bills, but you know what? I, I love that because that's pure seventies rock star, whatever. Yeah. yeah. I mean, okay. But, you know, the record company guy just went, okay. 
Yeah, he's making me a lot of money. You can fuck up my carpet. I don't care, you know. Yeah. So Slash used to do the same thing. I'm I'm not sure if you're friends with Slash or met him over the years. I'm oh, sure no, you probably I met did. him. One of the sweetest human beings yeah. ever. It's amazing. Yeah. Until it comes to smoking cigarettes, then he's one of the most uncourteous, insensitive persons you've ever <laughs> met because he did, because he was like the same way with Alice with a drink. He'd be that way with a cigarette. He'd be like, we could be literally in a telephone booth because yeah. folks. At one point in time, there were things called telephone booths where you yep, go yep. in and you put a dime in. Maybe it got up to a quarter, but but a place that small, yeah. And he just light up, and it would be like, what? <laughs> well, you know, what? it's funny you mentioned uh, phone booths. I, I was thinking about that. You know how you know people you change as you, as you know time goes on. I remember, you know, back in the day in my twenties, you know, if I ran out of money and my phone got shut off. I go, I don't fucking care. I'll just use a I'll use a phone booth. Now the thought of that, of like not paying a bill, you get into this like economic seizure. Oh my God, I'm gonna fucking blow my brains out. It's fucking unbelievable how how we change. And and those are the type of things I think you gotta keep away from your music when you're practicing or writing, you know, those sort of yeah. that have been like injected into your brain for the last, you know, 50 years or whatever. Because I think that's that's the thing that that sort of limits the freedom of thought that's that's necessary to create pro properly. You know, you know what I'm saying? It's like that whole uh, these rules and regulations that we start following, and we don't even fucking know why. You know, Formula. I understand why people are supposed to wear masks, but you know, I, I don't think government does anything really well. You know, so. Well Check this shit out. This goes with what I was just talking to a guy here in Sweden, a songwriter, um, Johan Becker. And he's like saying he knows a bunch of these big Swedish producers that produce a lot of big sure. pop songs Katie now. Perry and, yeah. and and we were we were talking the other day about how well, where's that voice now? Where's that distinguishable voice? Like an Alice Cooper voice. Where are all these individual voices because everyone sort of sounds the same now and yeah. he goes he talks to his producers that write all these hit songs and they're like no we don't want people to sound different you have to sound this way now because it just fits into the like the next song into the next single and i'm right. like fuck that i where's my robin zander where's my fucking steven tyler where's my alice cooper i want a, an individually unique voice i mean you're right. a singer as well um I, I i i sort of moonlight as a singer i make some solo records with me singing on it but i mean i'm not a god gifted singer i always say i'm a learn I, I i've i've tried my ass to you know work my ass off to sing right are were you yeah, naturally well, good? well well no the 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 point of it um you know, it, I, I feel like, you know, be, be, I don't know, uh, uh, I think being in the States, for example, it's difficult to judge what's happening musically everywhere because uh, the United States turned into this kind of uh, proactive management of all things cultural. You know, you can, certain words you can say, certain type of music is okay, uh, certain clothes that you wear are okay, but then if you step out of that, um, it, it's it's very strange, but there's a tremendous amount of new music uh, coming out of Europe. Now, I know you weren't referring to, you know, all music. You're talking about the, this lineup of producers that pretty much owns the airwaves. I know which, I know exactly. At what this you point, mean. you know what I'm talking about with that, right? Yeah. And I, I think I think um, Billy, Billy Eilish, I think, kind of broke out of it. You know, I, I, I really like her stuff. I like also her approach to her videos and and all of that stuff, you know, and, and, and she sort of broke, broke out of the mode, but, but I mean, a lot of them are stuck in it, but I mean, if you look at all the music that's happening internationally, I mean, like, you know, Arch Enemy, uh, you know, my friend Alyssa White Blues is just a phenomenal talent and, and, uh, uh, you know, um, Battle Beast is another one, uh, that, uh, I think, I think, uh, you know, uh, Nora is just an amazing singer. You know, the guitar players are really great. So there's a tremendous amount of styles and energy and, and original voices uh, emerging. Uh, but just, you know, the, the genre specific uh, sort of limitations that are happening in the United States, it's, it's very unfortunate. I mean, you know, Arch Enemy will headline Vakken with 80,000 people and then they'll come here and, you know, you got to play at like small theaters and everything just because the music style is not, um, it's not really allowed. I talked to a very well-known producer, you know, and I was saying, you know, I, I said, geez, you know, the, uh, Arch Enemy just played, 
in Buenos Aires in front of uh, 800,000 people, you know. Uh, the two things on that is I was just wondering, like, the guy standing there in the middle, I mean, I guess he's just got to let go if he's got to, you know, use the bathroom. I mean, what the fuck do you do? It's like, it's just, just dying like Alice would drop his thing. Coke. I might, I, he might just, you know, drop it right yeah. there on the floor. Yeah, but I, I said to him, I said, you know, some capitalist might say, hey, look at this. I mean, I just want a piece of these numbers, you know, bring it over to the United States and, and push it. And he said, it's not allowed. You know, that that form of music, that that heavy metal, you know, rock and all that stuff, it's just not in the wheelhouse of what record companies or, or just sort of the entertainment uh, mafia will allow to happen. So, you know, there's we, the, these we are keep, cultural trends. With Alice Cooper, it's like, you know, we always say you play the A, B, and C markets. We're, we're going through the alphabet now during these years, and we just keep pushing yeah. either more south in South America, more yeah. east and eastern Europe, you know, yeah. just, just if, as farther out as you can go. But there are mainstays. Whenever we play, I, for example, I live in Stockholm. I live in Sweden. Sweden sure. is in, and, you know, all of, of Scandinavia are such heavy rock fans, and oh, as yeah. well as so Amazing. many parts of Europe. Um, do you remember back in the days of uh, of touring early with Alice? Because you did catch that really cool second wave of Alice's career. Yeah. With, you yeah. know, with, with, when everything sort of exploded exploded again for him. Do you remember your first time coming to Europe and thinking, "What the fuck's going on?" Or what you know? I I just was. Uh... You, you, you see, at that time in the United States, MTV was the whole deal. Uh, and um, in these other markets, yes, there were music stations, but a lot of it was just more legit in terms of how people got to the show. In other words, uh, a lot of written word, a lot of word of mouth, just a lot of passion that brought them there, as opposed to a, a massive marketing uh, uh, scheme or, or plan that took place. So, you know, we would uh, we were hitting stages. Every place was sold out. It was just really crazy. And, and I, I was thinking, is this because of me? No, no, <laughs> no, no. But I, I was thinking, I was of thinking, course it was. You know? <laughs> but, you know, Alice would tell me, you know, it wasn't like that the last tour. I mean, he still did well, he said. But, you know, there's there's sort of a groundswell of energy. And he was telling me, you know, a lot of it has to do with with just timing, you know, things take place uh, over the course of, uh, you know, history in terms of cultural trends and everything. Things happen. I mean, you know, you put out a record now and it might do really well or it might do nothing and you think it's the best thing you ever did and all this stuff. It's just the way that things are set up right now, it's it's kind of a, a magic moment if you sort of drill into uh, you know, let's say YouTube and you go viral for some for some reason, you know. Yeah. You can't it, you Let me ask you something, on Kane. What is it? Is it is it relevant in 2020 to actually put out an album? Because the way I the, the way that social media is, and the way that news cycles and and sort of band cycles happen so quickly, is it even relevant right now to put out an album, or is it better to just put out certain singles, promote them as long as you can, and then put out another single? And maybe when you have ten singles, then you put out some sort of quantity i mean what do you think about that well i you know i was i spoke with uh, some record company people and and they they actually told me it's better to do let's say five singles over the course of a year four singles and you do a video for each one there they're, because you know um the the whole the whole tendency how the culture is staring at their phones all day it's kind of a big deal so i, mean, I think that's what a lot of artists should do you just pick the thing the 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 medium that has the most the most drill in i mean you know back in the day when we would tour um you know there was a tremendous uh, like when we hit england i mean there there would be uh thousands of people outside the venues before we went in of course they were all sold out and then we'd leave um i'll never forget we played i think it was birmingham england it was one of the first shows and I was the last guy to get out of the dressing room. I don't know what I was doing. I, I might have been eating or something. I forgot what was going on. So, <laughs> I, you know, I go downstairs and it was packed in the parking lot. I mean, just wall to wall people. And there's two security guards there and they got to take me to the bus. 
I literally got my jacket like torn to shreds, you know, and, <laughs> and that's without, you know, YouTube, that's without all this, you know, st- in England, you know, they, they had a music show, but it was all about word of mouth. So I think, I think the most important thing is, is, is you just have to, you know, any of the artists, you know, we can't really crack the Holy grail on how to do shit because, you know, we're fucking stupid, you know? So, so I think what we, are have we to stupid? Do is, are we stupid? Or are we just, are we kind of lazy as musicians? Lazy and stupid. It's a good combination. It actually gets you, you know, a lot of money at some point. No, but but so uh, well, I, I don't get know, you a white stupid. background and a saying, chair and good internet. <laughs> well, no, but we all have this. The thing about playing music is you're always fucking hopeful. You know, you're in there. You're in the studio. You get something that sounds good. You know, people are going to love this. There's a tremendous leap of faith and a tremendous amount of hope in in. And it's 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 part of what makes your music, you know, important because you you, you have to maintain those sort of uh, very um, positive, almost like ignorance is bliss kind of you know optimistic quality to yeah. what you do. But 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 you know, once you put it out there, there's just there's just no telling what's going to catch fire and what what isn't, you know. And then sometimes you know something like that song Macarena comes along, and you want to blow your brains out every time you hear it, but <laughs> everybody's listening to it, you know. And you're sitting there going, should I write a song like this fucking ridiculous? You know, and it's like, no. no you Did you, I, I call that chasing the dragon. I, you know, you see when bands do it. And here's the thing. I love it when bands, obviously my one of my favorite bands, the Beatles, they just kind of pioneered their own way and they went through so many changes. But then you see other bands, when they change, you see they're chasing the dragon. They're, they're chasing what right. was popular. They, they, they're going away from where they were were eventually at, at first, and then they're they're trying to become something else. And and many, many times it backfires on them. Yeah. I mean, case yeah. in point, I think one of the best Motley Crue albums ever made was with John Karabi, but the people spoke. They, they didn't. They wanted Vince Neil back in the right. band at that yeah. point. Yeah. And that kind of sucks in that way because they really they were into it, but at, at the same time they were. I could see them starting to chase the dragon. And did right. you ever right. get? Did you ever feel yourself getting in that sort of position of doing that? Yeah. No. The 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 Saints and Sinners record on Geffen. You know, of course, I had Desmond and Diane Warren and all these amazing people. You know, people that you've worked with. Yeah, that I was working with on that record, and. Um, you know, a little bit, you know, you get a little bit, you're standing in front of these these massive icons of mu- music, you know. I mean, Desmond and Diane used to compete on how many songs, who had the most songs in the top 20 that week, you know. And, and sometimes it would be five songs by Desmond, you know, it's just really insane. Um, but, you know, other than that, you know, I didn't get bullied into into recording that record but when everything changed and everybody says <clears throat> excuse me it was the coming of uh, grunge and and all that you know I, you figure the first time uh uh led zeppelin sang a song you know the first time you heard that and jimmy page hit that guitar and robert plant's voice it, the the shelf life for it begins it's not going to last forever see i was right. like i was pulling down serious you know money for me and and you know uh, I'm, I don't know if I ever said this before, but I, you know, I wasn't exactly being frugal about everything. I thought everything was going to last forever, you know. So I would be behind the bus in a limo with a girl in the back following the bus, you know. And and Alice, uh, you know, I'm sure he was looking out the window, going, "What a fucking idiot!" But but you know, spending his money. The kind of, that's the kind of the way I I looked at everything. So. Um, it, it was, you indulged, uh, you indulged the rock stardomness of it because you definitely were that, you know, you had that, that moment in time where everything was yours. Like, like Tony Montana, the world is yeah. yours, Tony. Yeah. And more. Well, well, Zach, Zach Wilde told me an interesting story too, because it puts everything in perspective. I don't know if you know Zach, but if you get on the phone with yeah. him, you just got to put it on speaker and lie down and just let him go, you know? And <laughs> He's become he said, like that sort of uh, AD. Um, what's that music thing that that you put on and all your centuries open up? Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, just put on, I just have a tin foil hat that I do, but it's really <laughs> a good one. It's connected. You know, but but so he he said, you know, turtles, like millions of them are born. You know, and then they're they have to cross roads, they have to go through jungles, and then they finally get to the beach. 
and the, the carnage is, is horrible. And then they finally make a run for the beach. And at the end, after the seagulls and all the people and everything gets to them, four turtles make it into the ocean. And he said, Kane, you and I are one of those turtles. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, oh, and so, so the, the point is, the point is that you're not you know, super. Like the music industry was like it goes all over the place. Everybody's, you know, first you know, hey, you're great. You know, some guy would say, oh, I fucking hate that guy. I don't even know why he hates me. But then suddenly he starts liking me a little bit more. You know, so you you can't really you can't really put your finger on it. But you just got to keep going. And he's right about the turtle thing. You know. You do yeah. what you got to do. Whatever's going to make you happy. What is Shep Gordon, who I, I, I know that you know him. And I don't know if I yep. said this, you know, before on your show, but he said, your real job in life is waking up happy every day. And, you know, that guy has, is loaded with fucking stuff like that. So much truth. And, and you know, he's right. You know, that's that's what we all have to do is, is, uh, is wake up happy. And if that means you go down and you kick the crap out of an 80-year-old, go do it. No, no, I'm kidding. Don't do that. Don't do that. Yeah. But uh, no, I'll take that advice. Just waking up happy every morning, and that's my job. Because if yeah. I can do, you're, you're exactly right. I, I get it. You know, and I, it's not I, selfish because you'll put good things out to other people. You know, absolutely. And, and, yeah. So that's that's the key. You know. Well, I mean, there is a segment in the show that I have because we're breaking it a little bit up into segments now. And I yeah. think we've already done, you got to go backwards to go forwards because we talked yeah. a little bit about the past, but that was taking care of business and any sort of um, business advice that you can give people that are listening right now about the music business, because it is kind of a weird thing. I, it's like, yeah, of course. Yeah. Learn your instrument, practice it. Everybody knows that you got to do that. But what are those little intangibles? And and at the end of the day, there is that X factor. We don't, don't know what the fuck's going to take someone from this level to the stratosphere. But yeah. what are if you as you have been in the trenches, if you've been that turtle over the years, right. what but are the things that you've uh, sort of learned that have that have helped you in this business and maintain yourself? Well, well, see, see, when when things changed before, I was so sick of the music business, not not the um, not the fans, not the people, not playing live, not recording, not singing. I mean, you know, it's it's all really it's all really good, you know. So so the part that I hated was the business. I mean, I you know, I don't know, I don't know. You probably have you done like a radio promo promo tour, you know, and you get off at some city because you're flying all over the country to go to radio stations. Right. And guys are walking towards you. They're your promo guy in that city, you know, and you're just going like, oh, please don't be him. Please, please, please. Like, hey, it looks like we got a hit. And you're like, oh, shit. And you got to be with this guy, you know. Art, Artie Funkin. Artie Funkin, is that it? And that's Spinal Tap. He's got no timing. He, he's yeah, exactly. the one that organizes. It's like that type of a thing. So, you know, and, and I remember we went into uh, one radio stations. You know, everybody wants the P1, P2, P3 station. So we go into some station. And I see some guy there, uh, you know, we're waiting for the program director, right? So there's another record company guy there. I don't know what the label is. And he's sitting there with a box of donuts. And I think there's donuts in it, but I'm going to assume that that's what it was, you know. Okay. And so okay. he comes out and uh, the program director, he sees the Geffen guy and he says, all right, come on in, you know. And we go in and it's for that song, Does Anybody Really Fall in Love Anymore? So um, he sits down, he goes, all right, play me the song, you know, so... The keyboard goes, dun, 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 and he goes, oh, I'm, I'm adding it. That's fucking awesome. And then he looks to the guy, and he goes, so how you been? So obviously the deal was cut way yeah. before I went there. He bought the guy a BMW. I mean, <laughs> who the fuck knows what happened? That's good. I just went, well, at least he loved the keyboards in the beginning. That was enough, you know. There it is. So Already it was, was that one of those guys right there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Vic is quick. I'll give yeah, our producer yeah. that. He's he's quick on this stuff, man. You got to yeah, give him a lot awesome. of credit in the chat. <laughs> So, so I, I'm just telling you, like, like, so, so I got sick of that. And he's, and the thing is that, that there's, you know, people that you're not going to like waiting for you to, and they're, they're going to give you an opportunity. They're going to take everything they can from you. Well, you know, the, the, the thing about musicians is this, is that our particular craft started with, you know, uh, people standing on the side of the road with these shoes that are curled up with bells on them and they're playing a mandolin or something and rich yeah, people were the court like, jesters were the court yeah they jesters. drive by and they throw meat or apples at you or whatever it's still the same it hasn't changed you know and 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 you have to you have to look at it like <clears throat> excuse 
excuse me, you can't protect yourself to the point where nothing bad's going to happen. You're not going to ever get ripped off. You're not going to do it. You just got to keep your head about you, about you. But I believe if you put as much work as you possibly can, something's going to happen to you if you make yourself great. Um, there's, there's a guy named Art Blakey from the Jazz Messengers, like kind of an amazing jazz band. At, uh, he's a drummer right. from way back in the day. And he said, if you get good enough, the world will beat a path to your door. And I, I really, I really still believe that. I don't know if I said that in the last interview, but, well, the world but will I come still believe that. To meet you, I think. I think the world will come how as long as you have a definite goal in mind and you do something every single day to get towards that goal, the world will actually come halfway. It'll meet you. Right. Right. But, but, but the most important question is, uh, Kane Roberts, did you ever work for meat and apples? Yes, I, paid I was uh, I actually had a uh, opened a restaurant. It was a meat and apple restaurant. It was unbelievable. We'd make these <laughs> these steak sandwiches in between two slices of a Fuji apple. It was fucking awful. Dude, I didn't no, no, I, no, I, I, I didn't do that. Yeah, I've yeah. eaten much weirder shit. Yeah. I mean, you've you you've been on tour all over the world. Have you ever? Yeah. And you've been on many a radio promo. I'll tell you, my experience with radio promo was just because I was just the other. I was the plus one. I was Gilby Clark's plus one because it was Gilby right. Clark's radio tour. So I just had to basically sit on the side, um, do the drugs, and um, basically eat the food. That was it. Right. That was my yeah. whole job. Drink the liquor. Just, just, just whatever was offered came my way. <laughs> Yeah, it was yeah. Like ridiculous. You just like become so, a consumer of the lifestyle. Yeah. Well, but I was. So, the, I was the. Oh, go ahead. Finish. Finish what you were saying. Nah, but but what I'm saying, my, my experience was basically, if you are going to go on a record, uh, one of those radio promos, which is never going to happen again, let's be honest, folks, yeah. P1s and P2s, those of you that are in the chat room right now, those, those are really important re radio stations at one point in time. But now it's not. Now it's way more important to get onto a Spotify playlist. Now it's way more important to be on, you know, trending on on some sort of Instagram story and stuff. So, I mean, things have changed and we do adapt, but the attitude is the same. We are optimists. We are as, as musicians, yeah. we are optimists. Yeah, you, you got to you got to you got to do that. I mean, um when when I was on tour, uh, the first two tours, the 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 well, the only tours I did with Alice, uh, the Constrictor tour, and uh, Raise Your Fist and Yell. Those were the um, only two tours that you did with Coop. Those are the two tours I did, and I was uh, really um, hyper back in those days. I mean, you can imagine, um, you know, because you know, people say right now I I get a little bit overzealous, you know, a little bit, you know, amped up too too high, you know, so. It might be the methadrine, but I don't think so. I think that, no, no, I don't do. By the way, I don't do any drugs, but and, and um, neither do I. Yeah, but uh, boy, did I do them before! Oh my and, lord! And so did I. Yeah. So, but the, the point is that I was so um, I was so wired all the time, and and I, you know, I somebody just asked me by the way, uh, what was it like playing with Kip Winger? Do not play with Kip Winger. <laughs> Guy's dangerous. He's out of he's his gonna, mind. He's, he's the, gonna grab he's your the penis. craziest motherfucker that I've ever met. I, and I'm serious. The first thing he's going to do is just grab your penis. Why does yeah. he do that? What, 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 what? The first time he did, I asked him to, but that's a whole different story. <laughs> you know, no, no, but, but, but I got to get him on the say, like, show just for that. <laughs> a lot of people say to me, hey, you know, so what was it like touring with Alice? They go, well, you know, he and I, I don't know who does that now, if anybody does, but I used to stay in the back room with Alice because my, my bunk was too small. And, and uh, you know, everybody said that, you know, what was that like? And I said it was a very happy gay time for, for everybody. And, <laughs> and, and I mean gay in, in, in the sense of, you know, the traditional sense of, of happiness, right. you know, at least for the most part. You know, he and I were very, very respectful. Did you have... Okay, because I've gone through basically a transition with Alice. When I joined yeah. in 96, and yeah. I've been playing with him for since, you know, basically since so coal long. was invented. Dude, yeah. get out now while you still can. <laughs> I'm, unfortunately, right now, there's nothing to get out of. We're oh, just... no, it's going to come back. You'll be playing in front of, uh, you know, 10, 12 people pretty soon. Don't worry about it. It's gonna but be it awesome. will be an arena. It'll be an yeah. arena with 10 or 12 people. <laughs> They'll have, like, all cutouts. You know what I mean? It's just unbelievable. <laughs> but here's the thing. 
when I first started, because that was one of the points I was we were going to do for part two, because we were like, oh, what the fuck? We have nothing to talk yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We haven't even started yet, and we're already fucking an hour into it or half an hour into it. But um, basically, what it was like when I was in the band, when I've been in the band, when I'm in the band, because there's been transitions since I've been in the band, and when it was like when you were in the band. When I first joined, we, we had everybody, including Toby Mamus, uh, band and crew, on the on the bus or you know on 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 the one bus alice as well yeah there was a yes he was alice on the same as well. bus. okay yeah, yeah he was on the same bus so we had basically up to 11 12 maxed out there might have been another crew bus but but that didn't come till a little bit later and now it's five and five we have five people on the bus now the person in the that back lounge is cheryl cooper because she's oh. in the show so yep. alice and cheryl we have these star coaches now you're saying that when you started, it was was it the band and crew, or was it basically? It was just the band and and Alice, and uh, he and I, you know, stayed stayed in the back, and it was okay. I mean, all we did was watch kung fu movies and horror films. So so you know, and and it was those it was those um, kung fu movies where. You know, they would jump up and they'd be able to kind of fight, uh, you know, in the sky. Like, you know, they'd be doing this and then they mm. and, you know, I used to say, like, why wouldn't when they jump down? Didn't they go straight down? They kind of went like that. And I was thinking, you know, that's good because now they got some space and they can, you know, they got more options. If they're down here, they got to keep going at it. And I think I think <laughs> yeah, they were Kung pretty, scared pretty good. Like, you know, yeah, Kung real, pretty that's pretty real good. stuff. You know? yeah, well, let me ask you this. What now? now did you get him into watching kung fu movies before the oh, show? Because geez, to this no. day, no. Be, Alice, to this day, he still watches kung fu movies to get yeah, hyped no, up Alice, for the show. Alice brought all that stuff to the to the party, and he and I would be. I mean, I got to be honest with you, we'd be laughing through just about you know, just about everything. I mean, uh, and and you know. <laughs> Yeah, I can't say that's right, but but you know, there's there's uh, there's a bunch of moments that we had together where you know we were just laughing so hard, I, you know, and you know uh, this is a little bit odd, but I was doing those rock and roll fantasy camps for a while, and we got Alice to do one, so I hadn't seen Alice, I think, for maybe ten or fifteen years. It had been quite a while. Right. So I went up to his hotel room and, you know, it was like, hey, you know, it's good to see you. So, you know, he wanted to hang out with me during the rock and roll fantasy camp thing. And we're in the limo going there and we had laughed so hard, you know, immediately. Uh, so they had to pull the uh, pull the limo over and, you know, <laughs> wait. I said, you know, we said we can't go in there like this because we were, we were in tears laughing. Cheryl's looking at us. Do you she remember what it was about? What? Do you remember what the what the conversation was about? Well, you know, yeah, there was, you know, when we first got together, the drummer in my band was in New York, and it was this really wonderful guy, really great drummer named Victor Ruzzo. So we used his garage to, to record some of our first demos, you know. And, and right. you gotta you gotta admit, I gotta understand Alice and I knew us knew each other for like three days, you know, and we're just hanging out like you know, buddies from like you know, 20 years. And you had that connection, man. That's cool. Yeah. And, and what's his name? Uh, you know, Victor, the dog was freaking out. So <laughs> Victor picks the dog up. Right. Yeah. And he looked like he was going to punch the dog in the stomach. You know, he didn't do it, but, but he, he like shakes the dog and he's like, and Alice and I later were laughing so fucking hard because he was dealing with the dog like some guy that he was going to, he's going to kick the shit out of the dog. So he's threatening him with his fist. <laughs> his name's Victor no Russo. Idea, you know? Anybody that's named Victor Russo is go and plays drums is probably yeah. going to, you know, think about punching a guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, he's, <laughs> you, but he, he was a badass kind of a tough guy. But, you know, I was, I told him later, I said, you know, I, I think, I don't know if your dog understood he thought it might have thought you were playing with him. I don't think he got it. He goes, oh, he got it all right. You know, so. <laughs> 
<laughs> All right. Well, you know what? Hey, everybody, let me let me take a quick a quick break right now from the actual podcast because we just, it's just been me and you to, going back and about forth, sparring yeah, back and yeah, forth. Yeah. Everybody that's in the chat room, we see you. We see you guys' comments coming up. Uh, Victor, thank you very much for putting them up. If you are listening to us just on the Apple podcast or the Spotify platforms or any of those other platforms that don't show us, uh, you can always watch the rebroadcast on our YouTube channel. Make sure you subscribe to that right about now, Funk Soul Brother. And um, yeah, I have Kane Roberts uh, on the In the Trenches podcast today. We are, I mean, there's so many things that I want to talk about. I, I, I really have now a, a format, all right? Oh, this is my, okay. I, I talked to the guys in, in the team and I said, look, we got to have to Maybe we'll step it up a couple notch for part twos. We'll yeah, make it a little let's bit do more it, of a man. part. Get into the dark underbelly. I'm oh, here. Fearless. Well, well, the thing was, we talked about taking care of business. We talked about those things that that, that keep you sort of relevant, keep you working, keep you um, noticed in the business. Is there any other types of tips that you want to give someone that's coming up to? Like any other tips besides no, don't you know practice thirty minutes a day? Yeah, we know that. Yeah, we. Yeah. But what else is it? Well, what? well, now somebody just asked me, uh, you know, that you that I suggested, you know, you do mostly videos during this COVID thing, and and I think I think you have to make a lot of videos. Um, he he was, uh, you know, once once this COVID thing uh, fades out, one of the things that's going to happen is you're going to see a lot of people are going to monetize different technologies. They're going to find different ways to interdict. I love that word, interdict into the public. So, so the, the point is me. that, yeah. So the, the point is that, that I think, I think making videos is, is really important. The live show thing will come back, but I'm thinking, you know, with, with the advent of zoom and there's going to be pay-per-view events and stuff like that. You know, only because you know people want to make money off of off of music and what it is. So everybody needs to make to, money. But 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 the, the 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 one thing that as a musician you have to do is, you got to remember that uh, you got to make your own world. You know, you can't expect somebody to come in and suddenly you know bless you with this uh, you know brand new uh, uh, way model for you, a new business model, new opportunities. You really have to sort of. Um, you got to generate that stuff on, on, on your own. You know, people would say to me, oh, why did you, why did you lift that, that guy, uh, Ken Mary, that drummer, really amazing drummer. He's with Flotsam and Jetsam now. Right. He, he asked me, how come, why did you lift weights? And, you know, I'm not a hundred percent sure on that. Somebody might've kicked sand in my face a long time ago. Or I read the wrong. <laughs> oh, comment. I saw that. I, I saw that ad. I saw that ad where you kick sand in your face and then yeah. you work out and then you're able to get the girl. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it worked. <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding. No, no. So, but the point is that I felt also that, you know, as, as artists, if the camera rolls over you once, people have to remember it. You know, I think certain artists have that ability and, you know, some of them don't have to get, you know, freakishly big with muscles. Some of them just, you know, they are who they are. They have a tremendous amount of, of charisma that, 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 you know, come that, you know, just comes out of them. Um, uh, but, um, I think I think that was one of the main reasons. So, like, if people just saw me on stage with Alice, they would say, "What the fuck is that?" You know what I mean? And right. and what the fuck is a great thing to have people ask about who you are? You're going to generate a lot of hate. You're going to generate a lot of love. The thing is, that what you don't want is indifference. So, I, I think what people have to concentrate on is what you're really uh, great at, what you what you love, whatever it is, and you just gotta you just gotta hammer it on on every level. And I think YouTube has now become almost uh, uh, a great way for artists to communicate with people and also to see yourself and see how establish their establish their what it is that they do so great. Yeah, right. get their exposure out there, and there and you know people are hungry for content, even though there's millions of videos going up, uh, going up every day. Somebody just wrote, "You have to make yourself a brand," and yeah. and that really that really is what it is. Desmond said to me. Um, Whenever you record, when you finish, it has to be a record that you will buy. And that's that's a that's a tough one because you know we're all kind of complacent now, you know, in terms of buying stuff. We, you know, we stream it and all that stuff. He said, you know, forget the new technology. If you had to get up and buy a CD, would you buy your CD and you don't know anything about you? And and that's that's a you know, that's that's a big deal. You gotta step out of yourself and just kind of, you know. 
blow your own mind, you know, before you before you start thinking, oh, yeah, you know, this is going to be good enough. You don't want want to say that. So, well, speaking and, of and somebody by Mike just said people ask what the fuck about me all the time. That's a good thing. You know, don't worry about that shit. You know, <laughs> fuck them. Well, you got to check out his latest Instagram post. I, I even thought, what the fuck? Because, yeah, it was very arty. It was. But it was uh, it was basically him getting um, uh, having anal with graffiti. And it was good. Yeah. So, so there's a big <laughs> shout out to that. That's that's Mike Pinksock. He's awesome. Right. Um, but w speaking of your own CDs, because that's our next sort of um, our next sort of topic is why the fuck are we here? Or, you know, this is the main event. You did just put out a C, uh, you know, your own CD. Did you buy it by any chance? Did you buy your uh, new CD? Yes. Well, actually they sent me a hundred copies and I sent myself a hundred bucks. No, no. I, I, uh, <laughs> the new normal. Yeah. Well now see, if you look at that cover, the girl's yeah. wearing a spiked virus mask. The name of the album is the new normal. And the first song was the beginning of the end. Uh, Alyssa was, was kind of freaked out, you know, because it almost is, you know, it's like a Nostradamus thing. I predicted, you know, on the yeah. cover, you know, with the blood and everything. And by the way, that girl, Briarly, you know, she only had her eyes to convey what she was thinking. And man, she did a great job. Of what that. an actress. You know, it's really amazing. So, what an actress. What an actress. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and let me by tell the way, you, the I mean, it's, it's, it's part Nostradamus, part fortune cookie. Yeah, and, but, no, but it's all Kane Roberts. <laughs> well, no, I was going to say the record didn't sell. I mean, you know, uh, Frontiers put it out. I, I think Frontiers, it was kind of the wrong level uh, label for my record because, I, I, you know, it's not like I wanted to make a style of record because I just never want to do that. I just want to do what's happening at the time. Otherwise, you know, I'm. Uh, it's like I'm trying to sell a shoe that somebody else made, you know. Uh, right. So... And, and, you know, very often, you know, these record labels, they're almost like comic book conventions, like they cater to one group. So people go in there into their channel that are looking for one thing. So, you know, well, Frontiers, uh, is basic, Frontiers is it, it does focus a lot on classic rock and sort of an artist of, of that you were known with Alice in the 80s, uh, you know, predominantly and then putting on your solo records as well. But yeah. I could see where Frontiers would be very um actually happy to have you on their label well no but and serafino and mario the guys who run it are the real deal they're awesome because because you know they started in in a small apartment and their reason to exist of course they have a business model but is they they actually love the music there's one guy there that's kind of a fucking idiot but but you know the record company for the most part is is just it's a great you know it's a really great place so it was kind of a, a mismatch you know and then uh when i went to when i did that video you know, I made sure that Alice and, and Alyssa were both there and sort of pulled off a miracle with that. So I'm pretty happy with with the entire uh, system with that with that record. You know, I really wanted, uh, you know, more people to see it. I think the video is at three hundred and twenty two thousand right now. So that's a lot uh, of I, fucking people watching it. dude. Well, that's yeah, that's yeah, a real. I mean, I mean, you want more. You obviously. Alice, if you have Alice and Alyssa on it, just even from an interview, you'd get, you know, a, a million views. So so something broke down with the system on how they. They put the record out and the video out and the promotion and stuff, but that's fine. You know, it, I, I think for a lot of people, that's an awesome uh, record label. And, you know, it's Serafino and Mario badass. And I'll always, you know, I'm not on the label anymore, but I mean, I'll always, uh, you know, say good things about those guys, even though they hate my fucking guts. It's unbelievable. <laughs> I never said anything like it. I get emails like from, hey, fuck you. You know, that's it. You know, it's well, like, okay, you know what? Well, you're not calling anybody out for something that's that's not true. I mean, that's yeah. the thing. You're not you're not trash talking at all. You're just saying. Oh hey, no, man. I would never. No, it, it, this the the hatred started during the uh, during the the project. And you know, I took three years to record that. And if you think about it, you know, that's one patient fucking record company. And you know, Serafino was like, hey, you know, uh, I'm gonna, you know, where's my fucking record? You know, I finally sent him a song. Boom, he switched. He said, I fucking love this. This is awesome. You know, he did that with the whole record. So he's a passionate, real person. And, and uh, you know, I, I think the, the company's fine. I'm, I'm right on the cusp of maybe starting uh, another record with a different label. So I'm thinking of uh, um, I'm thinking of doing it, you know, and, and hitting it kind of <laughs> it pretty hard. I don't know what I'm going to do this time. I got to do something different. I mean, I told you last time, you know, I, I'm recording beginning of the end. 
and I go, geez, you know, instead of a guitar solo, I'll have Alyssa come in and just blow the whole song apart. And then I'll get Alice to sing. And, you know, they, I was blessed with the fact that they actually agreed to do it. So I'm going to try to do something, maybe top myself a little bit on the next record if I make one. Yeah. Oh, and well, by the way, we have a video coming out, um, I think this month. And then everybody's, you know, pissed off at me. But the the director's cut of Beginning of the End is almost done. So I have three videos coming up before the end of the year. So I like that. Uh, yeah. But let's let's talk about that director's cut because what what are we going to see from the director's cut that we didn't see in the original? Is there more? Well, yeah, there's more footage, you know, that wasn't there before. Um, yeah, because directors got, like uh, there's footage. some guys. There's there's some guys that I know that. Uh, uh, they, um, they, you know, because I do, uh, you know, I did a lot of broadcast design stuff. You know, we, I was at a company, I was the executive creative director and, and I, um, you know, we had commercials on the Super Bowl and stuff, you know, it was, it was a huge company that way. So I made some good friends with amazingly talented people with programs like After Effects and everything. So they're doing me a solid and they're re-editing the whole thing. And then they'll call me up and say, you need to have this here. You need to have that there. So it's going to be a much more pro uh, uh, video. Um, the, the last one, the, the, our director had a nervous breakdown. So on the last day, we only shot for one day. And from the last uh, day of shooting for 60 days, he wouldn't take my phone call. I don't know what happened to him. And you know, He was, in a, he was in a fucking rubber room, probably. He was in a padded yeah, no, cell. He, 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 had, <laughs> he had some problems. So I finally got the, the tape, uh, the, the tape, the drive. So... Um, so, yeah, so we edited that one really quickly. So uh, this one's going to be kind of the real deal. And like I said, you know, I don't know if I said this. And like I may have said, I'm not doing this to, you know, make a ton of money or, I, you know, I, I, I don't expect to. What I expect to do is put some joints out there for people to, you know, hit on and either like or hate or whatever. But I just like being in that process, you know, and, you know, communicating with people. That's why. You know, when you do shows like this, and by the way, you, you really, the show really feels, uh, you know, legit, like the essence of it is, you know, all the plates are spinning that you want when you do a show like this. And you, the you aim know is that true. Com communicating the with people, yeah. I know that does a lot to your heart, and it does the same for me. I mean, I hate no. everybody, but I love them too. So what are you going <laughs> to do? The fact is, you know, what 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 does Mozart say in Amadeus? This is maybe Tom Holt says it, not Mozart, yeah. but he says, uh, "I'm you a vulgar man." There. Yeah, no, well, I remember that. He says, <laughs> "He says um, I'm a vulgar man, but my music is not." And yeah. um, it, it, we we are kind of we can be cynical, we can be sort of uh, yeah, bleh, bleh. but at the same time we are optimists, like you said way yeah. back in the beginning of the interview, and uh, yeah. I think it still holds true. So I'm. I'm excited to see this new director's cut. It, um, do you have an actual release date, or is, are we going to just wait until the end of the year? It, it's going to be it's going to be within uh, four weeks. The first one, holy shit, is is going the video video that's coming out is actually uh, it, it deals with domestic violence, which I think is is a, a big fucking deal. Now everybody will say, "Ah, oh, geez, you know, you're getting into this dark political shit." It's not the way it is. It, it's shot. It's it's very violent, but it's shot with nothing but like, uh, you know, very paying attention to uh, the 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 essence of the song and just trying to get a message out there that you know people just sort of sweep that under the rug. You'll see a statistic that'll blow your mind, and then you know the next thing you're back into the the, the political uh, morass of bullshit that that's on on the airwaves all day. And I, I just think uh, this needed kind of a moment, so. Um, it's going to be coming out, you know, within two weeks and, you know, people get a chance to, to check. Well, you it definitely out, so. have a family here at, at, in the trenches. You have, you, I can see in the chat right now that you have so many supporters, so much, uh, amazing things being said about you right now. So I think it's actually time for us to, it's another segment and maybe Vic right. has a, maybe he has another, uh, an overlay for it. I, you know, he's shaking his head. No, I didn't, but it's called Ooh. let the people speak. And when I, when, when, when we do let the people speak, it's like, I will put out an Instagram store story. You do your thing. Oh, there it is. There's, there it is. There's your misfits keychain. Put it right there. <laughs> um, so when we let the people speak, there it is. There's our overlay. It's kind of, yep. um, you know, pretty haphazardly done. Probably was just typed. <laughs> <laughs> yep. but it's when it's when the people in the chat have uh 
ask some questions and we feel very relevant. And if you don't mind answering a few of them, um, Vic, can we put one up, please? This one comes from At Nights with Alice Cooper. What songs did you play on the Trash album? I think it was, I think it was just Bed of Nails. I did, uh, I walked in with Alice and Desmond. We actually wrote a song, but it didn't get on the album. But it was, uh, I did a, a solo and some guitar riffs and some rhythm guitar on that. And uh, geez, what a great record. I really, I really liked it. And um, I like to drive fast. I like to meet people and I like sushi. No, no, I'm kidding. I'm, <laughs> and I'm long kidding. sunsets and uh, horseback riding. <laughs> but the thing is, uh, Kane, this is a true story. And I don't know if you played it. You, well, you definitely played uh, Bed of Nails, but for me, Ever since I joined the band in 96, we never played Bed of Nails because there was a little bit of a taboo to it. And I oh. and I think there was a little bit of a, uh, we can't go there with the lyrics. I'm like, what do you mean you can't go with the lyrics? You have a song called Cold Ethel. Do yeah. you realize that you have a song about necrophilia, but but Bed of Nails? So um, I, I'm glad that we finally put that in the new set. And, and it hey, actually, by the way, I, I, I just want to make this really quick. I saw, I've seen you guys play a, a few times. Fucking awesome. I mean, I, you know, I, it's rare, you know, because when I, when I, you know, my involvement with it was pretty deep. And I think yeah, you you're, guys, part of, you're definitely you a huge have, part of the legacy, man. Well, but you guys, um, you know, it's now, it's, 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 it's a unit, it's like a machine. But it does. It just never feels like you, you're going through the motions ever, and it's really insane. And of course, you know, I, I absolutely love Nita, um, and and she she's just doing you know ex incredible things. And you know, all you guys, you know, every every guy has their moment, and and it's almost like you know those classic bands where each member sort of represents something a little different. I mean, with Alice, you know, yeah. Dennis Dunway had the low slung bass and. Neil Smith was the consummate Rolls Royce rock star. You know, right. everybody has has their own thing, and it's it's a pretty uh, pretty everyone amazing has show. A that's role. All everyone say. has a is a character. Well, yeah, that's, yeah, that's cool, man. I, I trust me. There's no one that that respects hearing that from you know Alice Cooper legacy. You know, well, I, I mean friend. it. So you know, whatever. It's just truth. Yeah. yeah. Well, wouldn't it be funny if I told you that that everybody in the current band suffered from amnesia and we couldn't remember the songs before we actually played them? So every single time we get on stage, it's like the first time. It's very strange, <laughs> isn't it? You know? Amnesia. I the can't even Anderson, spell. You don't can't remember one of the songs. Like the next Kane, week. if you can spell amnesia, I will give you, you know, a m n e s i a. Perfect. I don't yep. know. I, I, don't know know I, it already. I, have I was really proud of that. What, what am I, four years old? What the fuck? <laughs> you're, no, you're, you're, you're Trump. You did a cognitive, uh, like, you, a, you passed your test. completely, like, uh, engaged, too. You know, I had to really concentrate. Uh, <laughs> you passed the test, dude. You did a cognitive kid. test. Awesome. <laughs> um, let's bring another question on, Vic. I, I would like to let the people speak. Uh, Toby.f.06, are you married? Oh, wow, well, I usually mean. keep my personal life... Um, you know, uh, uh, you know, covert, you know, if I meet somebody and I shake their hand, I go, I'd like you to meet my wife. So that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> it's very, that's, it. that's, very <laughs> that's it right there. See, it's close to the heart, it's close yeah. to the heart or, yeah. or even closer to somewhere else. Um, so let's bring another question. So let's gloss over that one. Uh, Fagiola. Fagioli. Fagioli. Well, Fagioli. First, my, my first name is Kane, but but uh, you know, in truth, uh, my uh, bloodline is one of the. Uh, I'm part Irish and actually part Welsh, so uh, I, I don't have much to say beyond that. But you know, I've never been to Ireland. I'm I'm hoping to go there. You know, Wales. You know, wherever I gotta go. So it, yeah. it, it trips me out that you said you know you did the two tours with Alice Cooper because when I think of your sort of like input to the whole, you know, in your representation of the Alice Cooper legacy, it seems like a lot longer than two tours. It yeah. seems like for, I mean, that, I guess that's the power of MTV. Cause I would see your ass on MTV pretty much every single day while I was going to GIT and trying to learn, right. a, you know, a harmonic minor scale, I think. Sure. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> it felt like that. I mean, but you know, I, I had a couple of records and, you know, we did spend a long time sort of, getting them uh, together. I, just, I remember being in Maui 
and Alice and I were trying to write heavy metal songs between, you know, mango shakes and coconuts and whales. And, you know, after a while we had to get out of there, you know, because we were writing songs about how beautiful the sunset can be. So we yeah. said, all right, we got to get the fuck out of here. Porpoise so, love. I know. Yeah, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> We only spend like one week there at the end of the year to do. Yeah, you know, it sounds thing. Place. It sounds yeah, place. yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome, because he does it? that that food drive uh, thing. I'm, I mean, I'm not sure if it's going to happen. Obviously, this year is going to be a little bit iffy, but uh, that is sort of the end of the year sort of um, yeah. bonus that we get to go yeah. there and play a show at the end yeah, of the no, year. Yeah, I, I used to, you know, I used to just go there and hang out, you know, and at, at his jacuzzi and everything, and look at the sunset and all that stuff i remember one time because chef's place you know it's sitting there right in front of the beach right on the beach and you got a little, little bit of a lawn and then you go down these steps and now you're right on the sand it's that close yeah, yeah. and uh you know i remember one night i went down there and the whole beach was moving i don't know if this happened to you but i oh. looked and it was like thousands of tiny crabs were just like running all over the place it was it was it was really a strange visual and you know i remember the next day i said to chef i said um i said uh you got crabs no i said dude i think you got crabs and he was going <laughs> yeah i know and he said by the way stay out of my bedroom when i'm sleeping with you no no but so i remember i looked at the place next door and i said you know does anybody live there and he said I just bought it. And I said, you just bought the house next door? And he goes, yeah. And I said, what, are you going to rent it out? And he goes, no, I, I, I didn't like the guy that was moving in. So I was like, oh, well, can I have some money? No, no, I didn't yeah, say that. Yeah. No, no, but, no but dude, I, mean, I, 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 need, I need to buy the apartment next to me, man. Yeah, no, and I do I mean, say apartment. It's fucking unbelievable. The guy, the guy is like the most awesome guy. And people don't know he made dinner for the Dalai Lama and you know, he's, he, he's, he it's definitely cool turned into a lot my of time. Uh, sort of father figure for me. So yeah. that's cool. Cause he managed you as well for a while. Right? Yeah. Back yeah. He day. managed me, as, for, you know, and, and, you know, was, he's probably one of the, the high points of, you know, my musical career, obviously meeting him and Ezra and all those guys, they're all, they're all, they all remind me of like these elders in some sci-fi movie. Now they're just like amazing people. So the elders, I, I call them the three-headed mantra. It's Alice, Bob, and and Shep, and they're like those yeah. Jason and the Argonauts. And it's oh, like yeah, yeah. Ah. Oh, Ray Harryhausen, yeah, awesome. <laughs> so let's uh, let's have one more question, or maybe a couple more questions um, uh, from the uh, where are the people. Well, there you go. Work up tips, please. That's not a well, question. You know, That's I, I think you know at my point, you know where I'm at. Um, I train pretty much every day, and and. And I don't make it a nightmare. I don't go in there, you know, if I'm not feeling like it. If I'm not feeling like it that much, I just do a little bit of exercises here and there, you know. And also, you know, I have sort of a standard routine, which, you know, any routine you can do that you feel standard you're going to do every day, it'll it'll grow into something better. But I'll pick a body part that I think is lacking. You know, if I, if I want to get my uh, legs up, I'll do a whole week of just squats and, you know, stay in the gym for like an hour or two or if I want to get my biceps or my butt to look better, you know, the butt's a big deal, you know, these days, not that I want to twerk, but I'm just saying that, that, you know, you got to get your whole body in shape, shoulders, back, everything. So, um, so yeah, so I, I think it's just come up with a routine. And then if you feel like there's something that you want to work on more, just spend a week just working on that body part. That's one tip that, uh, you know, um, you know, the guys I used to train with back in the day were, were all like uh, Mr. Olympia guys. You know, they were all, you know, gigantic. Some of the women as well, they were like way bigger than I was. And, you know, their whole trip was, um, oh, there's Dolph. Yeah, you know, Dolph the whole Hunger. trip was uh, to to try and and and, and get yourself, uh, you know, go, go past where you are. You know, he, here's the thing, you know, as in all things with bodybuilding, if you want to change, you got to change. You got to change things. You got to change how you train. You got to change how you're looking. Uh, yeah, Franzi, I, I know I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> I apologize for the visual. I'm Maybe that's in the that director's now. cut. The Maybe fuck? that's Why in the director's cut, dude. I'm not sure. But, but Kane, hold on. Just so you know, that, that last question, workout tips, that was actually for me. Oh, 
Oh, sorry. I apologize. <laughs> yeah. That's and funny. and 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 hey, thank you that you asked. Yeah, awesome. Kathy, thank you for asking. Um, I, I still do the 30 minute uh 30 day shred with Jillian Michaels. It's basically you can get it at Target. If you can still find it there, it's on DVD. I don't know if you guys know what a DVD is anymore, but uh the Jillian Michaels 30 day shred still do it to this day. Did it this morning. Look at those guns. Look at oh, that. There's nice. the peach is right that oh, way. When you turn your wrist, I like that. Mm, yeah, right, you got to turn it out. My like, Camaro's like this Egyptian. way. Yeah, Camaro's over there. The beach is that way. Yeah, Alice <laughs> taught me that one. So here we go. Do we have another question for Let the People Speak, Vic? Yep. Um, what's happening? Oh, what's the story? There it is. Ryan Rockstar Lavar. Why didn't what? I pick that name? <laughs> Everyone always asks me why. Why is Ryan Roxy? Why? Why did you name yourself Ryan Roxy? And because I, what I tell them is because Ryan Rockstar Lavar was already taken. Yes, um, that's there. I can see that. Well, what's, so what's the story, the story behind, behind the beginning of the end video with Alice and Alyssa? Well, uh, you know, once I got them along with uh, Aoyama Hideki, the drummer from uh, from Baby Metal, and I, I constructed a song and mixed it, and you know, uh, the, all three of them just they delivered stuff. It was just so quick and so amazing. You know, I said to Alyssa, "I want you to to growl." but I want you to sing in your, you know, legit voice as well, which is absolutely a stunning voice. And, you know, and they all delivered amazing thing. You know, uh, Hideki san sends me these incredible tracks and he goes uh, to show you what he's like. He goes, I hope they're okay, dude. They're just, <laughs> he, did, he did three takes that were just beyond belief. It was tough, you know, for us to, to even pick it out. So I, then I said, you know, I want to do a video for this, but I can't do it if they're not in the video. So I figured they would each green screen some little things. And I hunted down Alice in Vancouver. It was his day off. He normally just called, happened so to be I, coming through town. It was, it was yeah, great time. I had to, I had to crack through that, that, that sort of sacred territory of him golfing on his day off. And then I mentioned me it to Alyssa and Alyssa <laughs> said, I will go wherever you guys are to be in the video. So believe it or not, she flew from Europe to Montreal, waited at the airport for four hours and then flew six hours to be with us in Vancouver. She's and a trooper. She, well, you know, the thing is about Alyssa is her true uh, lexicon, the true way that she thinks everything is about being creative. Everything is about the artwork that, that, you know, you're involved with, involved with at that time. And, you know, she's a vegan. It's the same standard. She's an amazing, legit singer. It's the same standard. Her growling is incredible. You know, I've seen her on stage a number of times, fucking awesome. So I was just, you know, really blessed with that. And then I had a, a director who was about to, you know, lose his mind, which is okay. And a whole crew and everything. I'm just sitting there going, you know, I kind of pulled off a miracle a little bit. So, you know, that's a good question because, you know, it, what it what it really means is if you want something in life, you have to ask. You sit down and you're very specific and you send out your rocket of desire. And and the universe will will get it done for you. But you have rocket to get of you desire. It. And and the thing is that that, you know, everything that we do, our every step that we take is a leap of faith. And so why not go for everything? There was one point I was going to ask Oliver Stone to direct the video. I, I didn't do it. I, I forget the reasons why. But the point is you <laughs> the point is that that you um that you get it in your mind, you're very specific. I want this kind of a house in five years, whatever, whatever it is, you get really specific and it becomes your mantra. And I'd be surprised if something doesn't come back to you that, that's pretty good. So all right. I'm inspired. I, I wanna go, I wanna go start shooting off a bunch of rockets of desire. Do right it, now. Man. I did one this morning. It was freaking awesome. <laughs> Right before we got on, I'm gonna I'm gonna end the podcast and just like yeah. shoot off a couple of rockets with desire. It sounds great, man. Yeah, no. yeah, <laughs> My wife's out to dinner tonight. It's great. Yeah. So so hold on. You got you got the machine gun guitar. You're shooting out rockets of desire. Things are yes. happening. I well, love it. you know. Now, Look at that. It was going to be in my new video, but, you know, the, the uh, customs kind of stopped it. It looked too much like a weapon. So, you know. Do you think? I know. Yeah. Um, what? A couple more questions. What songs did Kane Roberts play on Rod Stewart's 1986 album, Every Beat of My Heart, and how much involvement in the writing process did he have? That's Mike Pinksock Usnick. 
Oh, yeah. Now, now, Mike, um, he, here's the thing. I was about to go on tour. I'll make this really quick. I hope I didn't say this to you last time. Uh, uh, you did Brian, not. But it did stop me. You and did not. So Ezra says, hey, do you want to play on a Rod Stewart record? So I said, yeah, geez, that'd be awesome. So he said, well, come on down to the studio. But now I figured he wouldn't be there. So I go in there and I'm tuning up the guitar in, in the recording uh, booth, uh, the, the control room, I mean. And I look in the recording booth and Rod's there in, in the vocal booth. And I'm going, wow, that is heavy. I'm going to get to meet him. So Ezrin shows up and I'm watching the two of them talking. He comes in, he goes, you ready? And I said, yeah, yeah. And he goes, I said, what am I doing? And he goes, you're going to play a, a blues live with Rod Stewart. And that freaking, that, when that voice came through the speakers, the monitors, I was just like, this is, this reminded me of what Jeff Beck did. It just, it was all sort of woven into my history of who I am. And so we, we played a whole blues. We did a couple of takes. They recorded them. I don't know what they ever did with them. But then for the rest of the record, I was playing, uh, you know, just little riffs here and there um, on, I think it was Every Beat of My Heart, or I think it was the album Forever Young. I can't remember. But, you know, it was a great experience. And, you know, um, he, you know, producing, it can be a very contentious kind of a rough thing. So I don't know if Ezra, Ezra wants me to tell this story. But tell it. Please Ezra do. goes in there and he's talking to, to Rod and things look like they're getting a little heated, right? And I'm going, geez, maybe he fucking hated what I, why don't I just swear there? I'm not going to swear. I take that back. Uh, maybe no, we'll he hated out. what I played, um, you know, no. and I was thinking maybe he fucking hated what, no, I'm kidding. Ah. So, so the, the thing is, so he goes, uh, he goes, uh, suddenly he puts on his hat, Rod does, and storms out. And I'm going, Geez, you know, this is, I mean, I played that bad. He walks into the, the, the control room where I am, and he goes, some people think they write lyrics better than you, uh, better than me. And he goes, you were fucking great. He goes, I'll see you tomorrow. And he walks out. And, and uh, you know, I, that I, Ezra came in. He said, geez, and I just gave him a couple of suggestions, you know. And I said, well, you're not really a nice guy, are you, Bob? What the hell are you doing? <laughs> Had nothing to do with my guitar playing. That's yeah, the, that's yeah that, was, that was a big relief. And then I got invited to his house for dinner, but I was leaving the next day on tour, so I, I couldn't go. Damn. All right. Yeah. I met Rod Stewart in a um, in a basically an airport during the check-in place in the X-ray stand. Sure. So my my story is not even comparable. I don't even no, know why I, mean, I said it. What did you say? Did <laughs> I you said, say, "Hi, how are you?" You know, oh no! I did. I, I you know he was with he was with a blonde girl that was about you know three feet taller than both of us. Both and, of us, yeah. uh, you know, he, he, yeah, and, and and you know I just said, hey, um, I'm just coming back from a European tour. Um, I play with Alice Cooper, and I just want to say that basically I had your poster on my wall when I was a kid. You're a great influence for me. Thank you. And yeah. I wasn't too fanboy, but enough fanboy. Yeah. But, but obviously led with the led with the Alice Cooper name drop, so I could yeah. at least get a little bit of you know a cred. Yeah, cred. And and he said to me, he goes, oh Alice, really good chap, really good yeah. chap, great to yeah. meet you, son. And it was yeah. like he called me son. So basically, yeah. I, I I might be Rod Stewart's son, folks. That, you might that, be, you know. Yeah, when I was in Maui once, because uh, I, I told people I had dinner with William Shatner. Okay, I was in Maui once. And I'm there with uh, some some a, a woman that was visiting as well, and she got on a phone call, and she she goes, "Yes, I'm here with you know Kane Roberts. He plays guitar with Alice Cooper." And I didn't know who it was, and she goes, "Oh, he wants to talk to you." And I said, "Who is it?" I said, "He's Patrick Stewart." So I was going, "Hey, it's like two captains of the yeah. Enterprise. This is like number two. And so the only bit, the like, only thing better would have been Captain Steubing from the Love yeah. Boat. And he was there too. <laughs> you know, that show, The Love Boat, always freaked me out because it was about how lying is okay. You know, like some yeah. fucking yeah. guy like uh, Fred Astaire would be on the show yeah. and he, he was the butler, but he told some lady like Rosemary Clooney or something that, that <laughs> He, he was the millionaire, and then they find out he was lying, and she breaks up with him. But Stooping steps in, and now they're back together, and they're leaving, and they go, hey, it's okay to lie. You know, I was Dude. like, oh, wow, that's, that's a relief. My whole life Every, is a lie. 
every subplot of uh, Love Boat, every subplot was cocaine addiction. So, you know, it's good. Yeah. But but go on with your story about the other captains, please. Yeah, so, you know, uh, Patrick Stewart says, uh, how are you, young man? And I was like, oh, is that his <laughs> voice? I have no idea. So, um, so, you know, I talked to him for a little while, and I said, you know, you're the second captain of the Enterprise that I've actually met and talked to. And he said, well, aren't you a lucky man? <laughs> so I was like, you know, he was kidding. But really a sweet guy, and he was just being nice, and he said, you know, good luck and everything. So it was just like a nice little conversation. It's good, so. it's good to come across a little bit fanboy, but then still have a, enough of the credibility because you do, you know, you, you have that association as right, well. Right, right. What, um, Vic, I want you to put up the, the uh, question about with Franzi. There it is, Franzi. She um, wants to see you twerk. And what song did you <laughs> want to play with Alice, but it never made the set list? There's got to be one. Well, I, you know, he and I always loved our first version of He's Back. Now, now the one that we ended up with, I love. So I don't want people to think that there's some sort of thing. Like, I, I don't think it's that good. But... Just, I'll bet your version, your version probably had more guitars. The one that you was, wanted. It was much heavier, you know. I mean, yeah. I did write on the second one, but you know, I, I don't know if you're aware of this. They got the guy who wrote "Like a Virgin" to come in and write with us on the version that went out. You listen to the synthesis. You know, listen to all the yeah, synthesizers yeah, like, on there. Yeah, you can yeah. you can basically hear it. You know. But if you can imagine uh, the demo we did, it, it ended up sounding nothing like uh, Trick Bag, but the the. You know, the guitar, like, you know, da, 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 and Alice going, he crawled out of his hole just to rock and roll. You know, it was a very sort of, uh, uh, it was like slightly heavy metal, but legit hard rock version of, of what we wanted. And I know that Frank Mancuso, the, the junior, the, the producer, you know, he liked the first version. So, um, but uh, that was one song that I thought, you know, would have been a real highlight of the tour. We, we only really performed He's Back when we were in Sweden because the song just did it was so well one, yeah. in Sweden. Yeah. It, was one of, it was one of those things. It was like, you know, and by the way, all, you know, music you put out, you'll find that some area really responds to it. Like in Utah, in Salt Lake City, there was some radio station that had four of my songs on the top ten off the, the Geffen record. I were all your songs pretty, about polygamy or what? Yeah, they're all about uh, poly polygamy and something you brought up a little earlier, anal. Because these are the type of thing. No, I'm kidding. I, I shouldn't you say know, They're just rockets of desire. That's all they are. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you pulled it all together. There you yeah, go. Yeah, that's what the good comedians do. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's what they do. But a bean. Kane. Okay. Listen, man, we're obviously going over time. I don't want to keep you all day, but but yeah. I, I love having you on. There's people calling for part three. Um, so I'm, I'm just well, going to do gonna one say, more. How do you properly play Roses on White Lace? I've decided, because of Ryan's request, I decided to tape me playing the song and then doing the solo. And then you guys can... Laugh at not, me. It was know. not just Ryan. It was it was it was Ryan Roxy and Tommy Hendrickson. We we said at you we we did sort of the roses on white lace challenge. If someone Vic, if you can find that post and just put it up for us. Um basically we we call you out and we say, Hey, we're trying to learn a song because it was literally a legitimate cry for help. Because we were yeah. trying to go well, we were I, you guys played so well. And by the way, Tommy's wonderful. I I you know, uh all Glenn Sobel, uh, Chuck, you know, it's just it's such an incredible band. I don't mean to keep saying you, that. Friend. But no, could you send me the twenty bucks that you? Were, no, kidding. No, I, I just it, it's just really uh, just an awesome thing to to see that. So yeah. But we were trying to we were legitimately trying to work through all the parts. And do you remember what was going inside through your head when all those with all those different parts going on? Because some of them almost sound dissident at certain points, but then they resolve. So, yeah, I mean, no, it was almost a progressive piece. Um, you know, I, uh, uh, the, the thing is, um, at that time, all of that stuff, like, like if you listen to the rhythm guitar, 99% of it is done, when I say in one take, one pass, not the first take, but one, right. one basic pass, like, you know, the, the, the sort of chugging guitar with the guitar stabs and all that stuff. And, and that was just because, you know, that's how the song gestated in my brain. In other words, I, I heard that stuff and they just started playing it. The guitar solo was, was in a very kind of, uh, you know, internally, uh, you know, when I played guitar, it was a very violent uh, uh, kind of uh, moment for me. You can tell, 
you can tell on that record, you know, any of the solos, you know, I'm picking the strings really hard. And, you know, yeah. uh, it's, it's almost like Rudy Sarzo said, you know, you got to, uh, Randy Rhodes said, you, you hold the guitar pick like you're holding a sparrow with a neck. You know, you got to be very gentle with it. And, it, you know, at that time, I was just not a gentle person. So, you know, you can hear that in the solos and everything. Um, and by the way, you know, Randy Rhodes was right, obviously. Um, uh, <laughs> but but uh, but the, the, the point is that that um, that stuff just was all in my head. And just fortunately, uh, you know, with Alice just being at the very you know top of the mountain, the band was just able to play anything I suggested to them. It was really incredible. Uh, you know, Ken Mary and, and, and Kip had a great and, band. and Paul and, you know, everybody involved in it. So, um, no yeah, doubt. I mean, I, you know, and you guys, you guys captured, uh, you know, the essence of it. It looks good. I we love we the, got the I love essence, man. Cheryl did as well. What? Yeah, we, we, we I think we I think we got the essence of it, but there's still a lot of subtleties that uh, at one point we look forward to uh, your yeah. so I your will YouTube that. response. I'll, I'll get that together. Yeah, it's, it's done. Guitar, so, yeah. Well, I mean, I guess that'll be five videos that you have before the end of the year. Then huh? yeah, <laughs> not just four. So just just to wrap things up in a, in a nice nutshell, because this has been a great part too. Actually, I think for one. We've had amazing internet. I think the prison guards, whoever holding you in that uh, in that questioning room, they've opened the window because I hear the ocean coming in. So it sounds very nice. Um, yeah. But but we've been actually really lucky with all the um, internet. It's been a great talk. I don't want anything to go south. You guys have been great. Uh, everybody in the chat has been very very uh, into it. They've been engaged the whole time. You've been engaging. I want people to find out where you are and uh, if they want to find out more and jump into that Kane Roberts rabbit hole, where do they go? Well, I would, go? I'd say, uh, you know, my video, uh, my uh, website's coming up pretty soon. My channel is going to be up obviously before the next video is released, but just, you know, if you haven't seen the video with Alice and Alyssa, that would be the, the, the Good thing. Place to start. And I'll, I'll keep, I'll keep people posted on uh, Facebook and on Instagram, you know, where these other portals will open up and you guys can, uh, you know, get to see me taking a shower, which would be mainly the main. <laughs> is that going to be the director's cut? Maybe as yes, maybe as that a is. Shower see, you never know. Mm -hmm. Well, Kane Roberts, um, you are part of the In the Trenches family at this point. Um, I will, I will definitely leave the door open for a part three at one point uh, when the world actually gets back to some sort of normalcy. But wait, this is the new normal, like you say, isn't the it? Normal, baby. Oh you man! Know, th I think good things will come of it, you know. Um, but that video, that cover, when I see that, blows my mind. No, it really <laughs> is. It, it is very Nostradamus, like you said, part Nostradamus, part fortune cookie. Can we bring that cover up just one more time so people can uh, take a snapshot of that and uh, admire the? Um, what, what, there's so many things to admire about that because you are a graphic artist. Okay. Did you have? Did you design this album cover as well? Because you have yeah, designed no, I, Brutal I, Planet. I think one of the, the keys is I, I I surrounded myself with such talented people. Michael Rosner is the makeup artist. Briarly is the model, and Miss G. It's called Miss G Designs. The letter G. Uh, she makes the mask and the headdress and stuff like that. So um, they're all radicals, you know, all of them, and how they deal with art and everything. So. You know, my thing was to give them, tell them what I wanted and, you know, not be, you know, not not kind of kill the creative process and let them just roll with it. And they just did a fucking unbelievable job. So it's just amazing. And then, you know, uh, the new normal, I think the new normal is going to be an improvement. We're going to come out of this a lot better. Everybody you just got to just got to roll through this transition period. So I'm going to keep shooting off my rockets of desire. I'm gonna keep um, I'm gonna keep optimistic as musicians that we are, and honestly, I'm gonna keep supporting Kane Roberts as all of you in the chat room will as well. Because uh, again, thank you for being on in the trenches, Kane. Um, it's been a it's been a wait, great part no, too. Sorry. You know, wait, yeah. no, wait, I'm reversed. I'll do this. I don't know. I don't know. Some sort of yeah, yeah. 
Right. Um, just, exercise. Ow. Ow. <laughs> <laughs> Have yourself a great day in LA. I'm going to sort of shut it, shut it down here in uh, Stockholm and everybody all over the world that's been watching and listening. Thank you very much for tuning on thank to you, In the Trenches. You've been yeah. great. Um, we will definitely see you again, Kane. And uh, until next time, folks, I'm Ryan Roxy. We've had Kane Roberts on. This is In the Trenches. Enjoy the ride. Cheers. <laughs> Trenches with Ryan Roxy.